We are at Everything Electric slash Fully Charged show in Farnborough. Woo! Gentlemen, please introduce yourself in this order that I'm waving. <laughs> that would be clockwise. The clockwise. Thank you very much, Gary. Hi. Go on, Gary. Gary Comerford, EV Musings podcast. Uh, Simon Rowe, also known as the EV Side, or a film by Simon, depending on where you search on YouTube. And Rob Shaw, also known as RS Thinks on YouTube. And I'm Greg. This is going to be a fun show because we're just going to be summarising what we've seen so far. It's Saturday, in no particular order. What have we done yesterday? I'll start with Gary. Interesting day yesterday. I, we did the media tour. Three of us were there on the media tour where they basically take you around and show you, oh, this is what's new, what they're announcing, and you get to see that before it gets open to the public. But the big discussion I had, there is a company called AW Renewables, aren't from the Arnold White Group. They have recently launched Kempower public ultra-rapid charging at 39 pence a kilowatt hour, which is the best in the market. And of course, I go up to them and the first question I ask is, how? How the hell have you managed to do this? And basically, the answer to that is they've got their own wind turbine <laughs> literally next door to where the, uh, the chargers are. I think that's a cor- the correct effect, isn't it? A fantastic, yeah, brand new wind turbine. And... I was there chatting with them for about 40 minutes and the wind turbine itself, they only use about 5% of the power from the wind turbine to actually charge or to, to power the charges. The rest of it goes into the grid and they get paid for that. So because of the way they financed it, because of the fact that they're providing power to the grid and because of the way it's built, they don't have a lot of the big overheads, a lot of the big power company energy charges, which a lot of the other charge point operators have. And as a result, they've been able to cut down the costs dramatically. Did you ask them how much the uh, the turbine was? I didn't, but they've invited me up there to sort of visit the site. And I'm I'm keeping my fingers crossed that they'll allow me to actually go up the turbine and stand on the top. And I will ask that question. We'll see whether we get an answer. When you get up, they're going to say, this is a one-way staircase. I'm sorry. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you, stay there. Big slide all the way down would be great. Wouldn't yeah, it? Oh, what's that first step on the way down? It's a big one. <laughs> so, what else have we done yesterday? We've obviously did some test drives. Do we? Do we want to talk yes. about that first? Or uh, I'm yeah, still recovering drives, yeah. from uh, from the test drive. But go ahead, Rob. Yeah, great. So, the event is the first event in the UK where you can publicly trust, test drive the MG Cyberster. So, as soon, obviously, we can get here a little bit earlier because we've got like media passes and things. So, I was straight in the queue, along with, obviously, Greg and Gary, too, to get booked in for that. And I have to say, it's fantastic. It's really good. If you get the opportunity to try it, then make sure you do, because if you think about it, it's the only two-seat convertible electric car currently in manufacturer, uh, being, being manufactured. Also, there is the Tesla, right, roads to the old one, but you need to be a millionaire to have one of those, whereas these are, I think they start at 60 grand, and it's so much fun. Yesterday was really nice weather-wise, so we had the roof down, got the wind in your hair. It's a fantastic car. Great acceleration, great features. It's beautiful. Like, really, really liked it. And Gary and Greg both had a go as well. So what did you guys think of it? I think my sort of response to it is it's now up there amongst the favourite electric vehicles that I've, I've ridden in. It's not my favourite. My favourite is the Ionic 5N, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure surely, because Greg has opinions. But I, <laughs> I did enjoy it. It's completely impractical. Mm. You know, there's not a lot amount of, the, a lot amount, there's not a large amount of storage. It's only a two-seater, but it's so much fun. It really is. For a weekend away, it, it, it's, it's got more than enough space in the back, hasn't it, for like an overnight bag type thing. It just, there's, there's no front. I don't think the front actually opens. So you, it, it's got a very long bonnet on the front. You think they would put some storage in there as well, just because of the, well, here's, restricted boot space. Here's the question. Could you survive with that as an only car? No, because there's three of us in the family. So could anybody survive with that as an only car? Divorcee? I think if, if you're Retiree. single, <laughs> if, if you're single, yeah, easily. I think if, if you're a couple, no kids, dogs, wanting to take people with you on trips and things, I think, mm. yes, you probably could. I think it'd make a great second car. Yes. Yeah. Like a, a fantastic second car. But yeah, it's, it's not family. Nah, definitely not. But it is still amazing. I, but then, I would but then still you don't one. buy a sports car for a family car. No, you, no you don't. If, if you're in the market for that type of vehicle, you're not going to like, you had an Audi TT, didn't you really? At some point in the past. So 
that's not a family vehicle either, is it really? But at the time you didn't have one. So Yeah. I mean yeah. it's it's like a, you buy a sports car you buy a sports car. You don't buy a sports car to load it with luggage and yeah. it's a go out and have fun car. Hmm. Well, I mean, look at this way. People who listen to my podcast will know I've drove Porsche 911s for many years. There's a lot of similarity between the Cybester and the Porsche 911 in, in the, mm. the form factor and that sort of stuff. But I could fit two sets of golf clubs in the back seat of the 911. It's a tight squeeze. Or a small dog. But a, or a small dog. <laughs> Chihuahua. <laughs> but there is, there is literally no room for anything behind you in the... Yeah, there are, there are no back seats. Yeah, basically. it was quite a shallow... No. Yeah, and, and it was quite a shallow boot too. Mm. So if you're doing golf clubs, it's the roof off, and it's going to be strapped under the passenger seat, isn't it? Yeah, Definitely. and I've done that before today. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think if you look from the back, basically it's the smallest front uh, no, bonnet, not bonnet, boot. Uh, boot. Thank you very much. Um, Trunk for American friends. Yeah. <laughs> then there's a roof, takes a lot of space. Yeah. And then you've got a cabin, the wind screen and stuff. Mm. The front a pillar, I think, is the technical term. Mm. <laughs> And then a very long bonnet. And I think the only reason they had a very long bonnet put on it is A, because it needs long wheelbase for 77 kilowatt hour battery mm-hmm. to fit underneath and be handling well. And it does handle quite well. I'm, I'm um, quite tall, so I was, I was kind of worried that my like, forehead would stick above the windscreen, but the seat on its lowest setting, it, it was fine. It was really good. Yeah, you have to practically lean back to sit comfortably in it. It's kind of designed for you to just settle in. And when you open the door, the, uh, the seat reclines a little bit and moves back to kind of allow you egress. Mm. If, you, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's got these really cool I don't know, dihedral doors or something, yeah. what you'd call them, that, that basically flip, sort of flip up doors, yeah. pivot up from the front and it, it looks amazing. But Gary pointed out yesterday, what would it do in like a multi-story car park? How, how high is it going to detect the roof? Is it going to it got hit the roof? You're going to have to watch it. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't see them. I didn't ask. I should. I mean, I wouldn't drive it in with the uh, the doors open. <laughs> no, but you need to get out of the car, don't you? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that was feature. But yeah, loved it. It was really cool. And you guys loved it too, didn't you? And yeah. we did get up to some quick speeds on. <laughs> well, no, we got to these spe- Le- legally quick speeds. We legally, got to legally yeah. quick speeds, but we got there quickly. <laughs> yes, we did. Yeah, I think it was well three and a half seconds to sixty, wasn't it? Which yeah. which was quick, but going on to the Ionic Five N. We'd literally just got out of that car like several minutes before. Mm. And if you've driven the Ionic 5N or know anything about it, the acceleration of that is just insane. And it made the Cybuster feel a bit more slower, even though it was three and a half seconds. So I, I, yeah. I don't know what it is on the Ionic 5N, but Greg and Gary both had a go in that yesterday. I've, I've had a go in that at the Harrogate show and mm. loved it. But you guys tried that and liked it, didn't you? Well, the, the sort of parallel that I that I draw on this, if I go back to the days when I drove the, the 911s, I had three different ones over the years. And one of them was the 911T, which was the one with the big whale fin on the back. And it had a three litre engine, the three litre boxer engine. And when you put your foot down on that, it was vicious. You know, it was raw power. I then moved on to the 964, which is the one without the whale fin. It had the bigger engine, it had more power, but when you put your foot down on that, it was just as fast and it accelerated just as quickly, but it didn't feel to be as vicious in mm-hmm. the way it does. And that's the difference between the, the 5N and the Cybuster. You've got very similar performance, but when you put your foot down on the 5N, it's kind of, you know, it's like in Spaceball where they've got a plaid and everything goes, you know, <laughs> the blood starts to be sucked from your eyes. It's a with, monster. <laughs> yeah. But with a Cybuster, it feels a lot more refined. Mm. And it's not quite as, you know, I'm going to snap your but spine and break your neck. You, you look at both cars and the Cybester has got that kind of country sports car type look and feel. Mm-hmm. The N is, I want to go fast and I want to go there now and like a bit bullish, you know, it's, but it's got that look. It's got the go faster bits. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you kind of, I think you kind of know what you're getting in for when you get into like the N compared to the Cybester. I mean, it's got the big red button on the steering yeah. wheel. You know, <laughs> it's got the blue button, but it's also got the big red yeah, button. No one wants they, they the blue button. They both do, actually. <laughs> they, they, they both do have the, uh, the big red button. I don't yeah. know exactly what, what it changes on the... Um, oh, it went from sport to super sport. On super sport, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I, I just sport. need to put a red button stuck to the front of the Tesla's screen then, yeah? There you go. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the Cybersteer is like more progressive in its acceleration, and the, the 5M is just brutal. It's, it's a thug, like... <laughs> it just it just 
wants it, to launch you to the horizon as it, quickly as it, it can. It suits Greg's driving style because <laughs> yes, it does, yeah, yeah. Greg treats the accelerator as a switch. Yes. It's yes. either on or it's off. What's the problem? And that's that's the <laughs> that's the five N method of doing it. Whereas yeah. with the cyber steer, it's kind of well, you know, we'll, Get there. we'll push this as a lever. It's just a powerful, but it's not an on off yeah. thing. For the record, I don't think I treat the uh, accelerator as a switch, but never mind. Well, uh, there are three people on this of- call who've been in <laughs> <laughs> who've been in the same car as you. Let's have you a might show have- of hands. <laughs> <laughs> who thinks we treat? Need- we need, to, we need to ask the guy who was in the cyber store with you yesterday from MG what he thought of oh, the, he did, he he was didn't turn up today. He's still yeah. throwing up. <laughs> I think he was giggling. Like, literally, because I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I, I want to try this and try that. And he was, he was giggling all the time. And I was like, I'm sorry, I don't know if you're like... That wasn't giggling, that was nervous <laughs> laughter. <laughs> I, had to, I, had to, I had to ask him multiple times. I was like, is this okay? He was like, yeah, yeah I'm, actually, I'm actually quite enjoying this quite a lot. And I was like, <laughs> okay, okay. So what did you guys think of the whole test drive experience because i tried to get a drive and a polestar for yesterday morning so i was there at literally i think maybe quarter to 10 when the show opened at 10 o'clock and the polestar fours were all booked out for that day and this morning on the saturday exactly the same thing again so i'm in a wait list to get one today now there are avenues to pre-book and it seems to be that people are taking advantage of those but obviously on the day people who don't know about that are turning up and and we're literally seeing them sprinting from the gate over to the stand where they want to have a go in a test in 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 a particular car and they're going to be disappointed because they're booked out like the 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 cyberster was booked out today and we were we were in the queue me and simon at 10 to 10 and they were saying it's already booked out and that's not anybody who's come to the show today who's booked that who hasn't pre-booked it so that would be great if that could be considered for the future i think having more vehicles available now the polestar 4 and the cyberstar are new to the market there's probably not a lot of cars in the country so they, they probably can't do that this time but i think next time try and anticipate the demand uh, particularly for cars like that that are going to be quite popular and, and make available slots on the day simon you've been out in the polestar 3 this morning did, did you deliberately go for the Polestar 3 or did you go for the Polestar 4 and then decide, oh, it's not available, I'll do the 3? No, no, I I kind of, to be honest, I didn't know what I wanted to test drive up until this morning and I walked outside and I just love the look of the 3 and bizarrely, like we was talking to Polestar and they were like, well, actually 50% are saved for pre-order, but they couldn't really tell us how that works, how the pre-order works and stuff like that. So I was like, oh, how about the 3? And they went, oh yeah, there's plenty. I was like, Okay, I'll book, and it was 10 o'clock, like the first slot, and absolutely loved it. Yeah. <laughs> it's up to the point where they told me the price. It was £90,000. I was like, I would really like this car, but I can't afford it. I'll come um, back to you later. Yeah, I, I just want to, I'm remortgaging my house at the moment, and that's not going to fit like with the price that I'm wanting. But honestly, the car is great. We done a, me and Rob done a, a video around it. Watch out for the YouTube crappy special that I'll probably do on that one. But compared to the what I drive at the moment, the Model Y, it just feels premium. I said to you this to you guys last night, it was like Tesla, and I don't hate me Tesla owners because I'm sure you're going to come after me after this comment, but the tech underneath a Tesla is great. The battery technology and, and things like that is brilliant. The car is crap. And like it's crap because it's just not a premium car. It's a 40 plus grand car that just doesn't feel premium. And you get into, granted this was a 90 grand car, but actually even if you went into the the Polestar 2, which is more comparable probably to the price, Mm. and that feels premium compared to the Tesla. So if they could get that premium in line with something like the Polestar, that car would be a winner. But unfortunately, like my next car won't be a Tesla. It'll hopefully be a poster or something equivalent. But it's it was a it was a great test drive. We took it around like the normal bit, put it up to a bit of legal limit speed. But it just felt like a really nice premium car inside and out. It just looks looks the business. The discussion we've had about power delivery mm. and you know breaking your neck versus something yeah. a little bit how how did the Polestar three rate? So if I can the what I've got to compare it to is either an i3 or some of the other cars that I've kind of test drive over the years. But mainly if you test drive it against the Model Y, the Model Y, if you want to kind of give it some welly, it will. 
and on the pulse star three was was the same but you don't have to treat it like that that's the point right it's i get to an electric car now having driven them for four years and the thing that gets me excited about an electric car now is how they look and some of the tech inside it's not that it's an electric car anymore because electric cars go fast okay like you put your foot down you it's a given go, yeah. yeah yeah you know so when i get into the pulse star three I kind of knew what I was expecting anyway, but the delivery of it was, it wasn't like gradual and things like that, but it was smooth. So like, if you wanted to be gentle and sort of accelerate up, like from a, from a starting point, you could, if you wanted to put your foot down and get some torque and acceleration, you absolutely could. But to me, electric car is now just a given that that's part of the parcel. The rest of it is, how does it feel to drive? Like the suspension on the three was great. Mm-hmm. If you compare that to the Y, the Y is really hard to on roads. That was perfect, in my opinion. My hum- very humble non-engineering opinion. <laughs> but yeah, I, I loved it. I just, I don't know what the, the low-end version of that car is and how much it costs. I would imagine around 50 or 60 grand, I would have, I would have thought. Mm. But for 90 grand for that car, I'm struggling in a 200 plus, was it 250, do you reckon, mile car, 200 mile car? Yeah. The guy that we had wasn't 100% knowledgeable, but, but yeah, we reckon 250. About 250. At, at least. So if we say compared to a Model Y, which is about the same, mm. that's a 45 grand car compared to a 90 grand car. I want to know where the other 50 plus grand goes, you know, because great, it's premium inside and it looks lovely and it drives lovely. Mm-hmm. Where's the rest of the cost? The cars, in my opinion, electric cars especially, are just still too high in their, their cost. If you want to... If you want something that looks and feels premium, or you go right down to the really sort of cheap end, which unfortunately you get cheap, you know, but maybe I'm just old fashioned like that. So I've just checked the range and official range is 385 miles for the single motor and 367 for the dual motor. So it's going to be WLTP. So so. it's going to be 300 or just under. Yeah. Still. 90 grand for a 300 mile car still seems excessive. I mean, we don't want to put put people off, but the, uh, the, there's plenty of cars on display and promised at this show yeah. that were under 30 grand. Like there's a Dacia, whatever. Spring. Spring. So the 15 grand car. I sat yeah. in that earlier on this week at another thing. And my opinion on that is it's exactly what you would expect yeah. from a 15 grand car. It's got everything you need. It's got real buttons. Don't expect anything more though. It's got a handbrake, Ooh. a proper genuine handbrake with a crank and Question everything. Question for you, Gary. Has it got a button for the glove box? Yes, it has. So oh, you're happy then? I'm happy. <laughs> We've got a story for you about the Polestar yeah. 3. So how many button presses do you think it takes to open the glove box <laughs> on the Polestar 3? I would like to think one, but in reality, I'm going to go with four. No, it's a Polestar 3, so it's three. <laughs> you, press, you press the vehicle button, you press the other button, I think, and then you press the glove box button and then it pivots down. We've got a nice video clip we can show you That's later. what £90,000 gets you. Yeah. Why? No no physical <laughs> plastic button on the no. front that will cost 50 pence or something. It's all integrated in the screen. I, th- I think they're just copying Tesla too much. Yeah. I can see to like your earlier comments when I got the Tesla and we started looking at Teslas like um, when they started coming out. And it was very much everything too much is in the screen. There's not enough buttons. I concede. Yes, after driving it for two years, Jesus Christ, put some buttons on the bloody thing. And I don't need a big screen to the left of me. I need a little screen in front of me so I can see what the hell's going on. (laughs) But yeah, so I bow to you, Gary. (laughs) I appreciate that, Sam. Thank you very much. (laughs) But as glove boxes go, it's nice and it's wide and it's damped. And again, VW, please put uh, decent side glove boxes in. This is you, premium content, get, isn't it? Club you box. Get the, you get the big, the big opening <laughs> that gives you half as much inside. So this yeah. has been Minor great. glove box glove podcast. <laughs> is it a velvet glove box? I know, that's, you know, what color was it? What, what's <laughs> the feel? <laughs> when you're editing this, you're going to have to have a little marker. You know, the glove box <laughs> section. section. Yeah, <laughs> let's go straight to that, shall we? <laughs> has, has it got some premium sort of shag? carpet in there and <laughs> I mean shout out to any glove box aficionados amongst my <laughs> listeners after the test drives and a bit of socializing we moved on we went upstairs to attend electric vehicles UK announcement by Dan Caesar prior guest of this podcast a very lovely man and also CEO of fully charged slash everything electric I don't know what the uh, the name of the limited company is but the uh, the show has been rebranded to everything electric 
who wants to talk about the Electric Vehicles UK is and what the promise of it is. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Gary. <laughs> Simon wasn't there. So just uh, the... Let me talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's to, been set up to kind of combat the misinformation that is being in the like mainstream media at the moment where it seems every article is bashing EVs, EV technology, electric ton, ton, electric ton, I can't say it, edit this. Technology. Ele- ed- <laughs> <laughs> Three, electric two, one. Tech, electric related technology and things. So they are setting up a sort of like body fully charged are going to be sort of heading this for the for the next 12 months with Dan Caesar as, as like a like a CEO of this I think. They're going to be bankrolling some of this too, with the idea that in another 12 months' time, someone else will take over and they'll be kind of spearheading this as well. Lots of initiatives they're going to do. Some of those caught my eye being a a YouTube creator in as much as they're going to be running kind of competitions for making videos to put like a positive spin on EVs and electric things in general, which, which kind of caught my eye. I'm all for doing that. I'd, I'd be happy to give loads of stuff for that free as well. So that that's that's a kind of cool thing from my point of view. One of the other things they were looking at was uh, what they called the hum and spoke sort of media strategy. And the proposal that Dan put together was they're going to put together a a website which will be not like the kind of websites that we see at the moment for electric vehicles. It will be very much a Netflix style mm. front page where you can select what it is you want to have a look at and then the content that is on there will not be necessarily fully charged or everything electric. It will be stuff from content creators like the four of us around here. And it, you know, when you click on that link, it will take you out to that particular website rather than them scraping the information, putting it on their website. So the incentive there is to create the good content so that they will look at it and go, oh, well, that's something that we'd like to link into. They won't necessarily put everything that everybody mm. produces, mm. but if there's a particular like I was very lucky my podcast happened to have been brought up as an example, but if, you know, they're not going to link out to all 200 knob episodes, but there might be like, I've, I've done a couple of misinformation ones with, with Quentin, for example. So they may link out to that as an example of, you know, when somebody talks about the, like the daily telegraph and the kind of anti EV articles Mm. that they're doing, Quentin and I have discussed Mm. that. So they may put a link out to that. And I think that's an excellent idea. I think I think Dan referred to this as a Netflix for you know pro EV or combating anti EV propaganda, basically, which is a good good idea because there's only so much they can do, you know, as a everything electrical slash fully charged. Yeah. They're doing an incredible amount of content. They're putting out you know hundreds of show of videos a year. I think, or well, maybe not hundreds, but like it must be. It must be in the hundreds. It might be in the hundreds, like the, yeah. the, 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 it's a vast amount of content and, but there's only so much they can do and they only do it in one style, right? Very professional, short to the point, sometimes humoristic with the, uh, with your former guests, you know, Imogen and Jack, Jack. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and other presenters, obviously other presenters are available. Yeah, we'll <laughs> this, this method, I think as well, allows they them to compete on an almost equal level with, say, like the likes of the Daily Mail with massive advertising budget and everything else because they can cherry-pick things from, say, the Take It EV podcast or EV Musings podcast that they're not having to pay to do that. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's it's a very economical way to do it because they, they're going to utilize content that they think is worthy and put it in there. They're not having to pay for this content. Yeah, and someone also... Someone to write it, someone to just, just yeah. to just And to we're doing it because story. we love doing it and we yeah, love exactly. yeah, doing yeah. that positive spin yeah, around yeah. it. Well, I mean, we're going to produce content anyway, so yeah. they might as well yeah. use it. I think it's important to highlight the fact it's not just about the content from people like ourselves. That, that there were, I think there were nine different things that he talked about. I'll go quickly through them because I happen to make, have made notes. Very, very, good, very good. He talked about a rapid response group. So this is the people like the Lorna McAteers, Colin Walker, Quentin, who can come back on a specific anti-EV article and provide Mm. that immediate feedback. He talked about an EV driver response group, so effectively outsourcing the response to people like us, so putting it out on social media and saying, come in and reply, give your thoughts on that. He talked about the voice of the million, which is something that Quentin Wilson is inspired or has inspired. This is giving voice to the lived experience. So you know, people talk about, oh, EVs can't do this. Well, no, let's speak to people who actually live with EVs and yep. get their 
real world. Right. Yeah. It, yeah, exactly. For a first-hand experience. Yeah. He talked about the digital hub and spoke, which we've already discussed. He talked about open source adverts. So they're putting a, comp- which Rob's mentioned, they're putting a competition out to anybody, any creator to provide some sort of a, a pro EV commercial and advert, and they will pick the best and, and promote that. And that will go out to all the shareholders. And, and, and that's based on a brief that, that, that they set as well. So they're going to give the brief out. You can uh, make something to fulfill that brief. So you're not just having to create something off the top of your head to mm. look on a, a particular article. They, they're going to be explicit with what they want. Yep. And it will be multiple formats. So it may not just be YouTube. You may be able to do some audio, et cetera. And um, we talked about influencer test drives. And the first one that they're looking there is, is doing one for politicians. So they're, they're going to put together a Westminster influencer test drive where they'll get a lot of the politicians who are in this particular area making the decisions. And I don't know whether it's going to be a 20 minute one or whether they're going to give them a vehicle for a couple of days. Yeah, they mentioned getting someone like Rory Reid, who's really big sort of like on YouTube with the Auto Trader channel. Yeah. He's quite into EVs, EVs as well. So he's part of this panel. Mm-hmm. So if you get him in a car with a politician, the politician can be asking the questions. He knows his stuff so he can talk about it. They mentioned Imogen doing this as well. Mm-hmm. So again, they know their stuff so they can... They can really help. They also talked about having a company come in to create regional test drive events in some of the more un- underserved areas, like an EV UK roadshow. And they put, I think, half a dozen different potential venues up there. And most importantly, OEM agnostic. So it's not just like Polestar putting up the, the show or just Polestar and yep. VW, but you know, you can get any OEMs. So if you think back, so I think we've mentioned before that the EV Experience Centre in Milton Keynes was a, a brilliant place. This is something that they are trying to recreate. So you have all these brands in one place. No one's biased to anything and people can go experience it without the pressures of, well, okay, are you going to buy this car and not? Oh, I can't spend time. We don't have people who know that stuff in the dealership. It's 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 going to be a great experience. That was and, a loss in, yeah, in Milton Keynes just was. because like that influenced so many people buying an EV that you wouldn't necessarily, you know, either get the ability in a in the normal dealerships that really didn't care about getting you into an EV. They, like you said, they were completely agnostic about like yeah. which car you got into. They just wanted to tell you the facts. And the more stuff like that you do around the country, the better. Absolutely. And the only reason I'm driving electric today is because I went to the EV yeah. Experience Centre, borrowed the vehicle that I was looking to to use, had it for a weekend, thought, yes, this will work. Went out and put down the uh, deposit on the lease. I'm I'm the same. When I was looking at my car after my leaf, I looked at the ID3. I borrowed one for a week from the EV Experience Center. I thought this is great. I got one, and I even claimed back the cost of my hire yeah. because that's that's just something that they did. So I think about 100 quid, I got that back. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons I have e Nero is because I got it off them for a week to review. To be honest, I didn't want to. You know, it was, it was also a great place to just check the cars out. Yeah. It's fairly cheap to actually get them from them. But so we we've all been guilty of using them for that reason and they were quite fine with that because we're promoting stuff but the i remember after driving my the inero that they gave me for a week i literally returned to uh to the gentleman i can't remember the name of the actual guy who served me at the time i'm sorry but the i said to him he was the manager i think of the lewis uh, was it lewis it must have been lewis Might yeah have been lewis. Could have been lewis um, yeah. and i said to him look however much this costs, because I knew that they were pulling them out because the dealers wanted them back. However much you want for this, happy to take it off your hands. And he's like, no, I couldn't do it. It's owned by the uh, the actual company. We're just leasing them from them, which is, a sh- which is a shame on one hand. But on the other hand, I just basically went straight away and took, put a deposit on the on the Enero, the next release, which was for model, model year 2020, mm-hmm. trim for it, doesn't matter. And you know this is what I was been, I've been driving for the last four years, right? So excellent place. I I still miss it to this day. Yeah, yeah, it it was really good. And and I I know some other people that did exactly the same thing. I I've said have a have a look here. There's no pressure. Just pay like I think it was fifty quid or something. Yeah, like, I paid fifty, 50 quid for the long like a weekend. Couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and then they'd also do the free twenty minute one. So the amount of people I pushed in that direction that ended up getting them as well. It was just a great place. Like, and bums in seats always we, work. Yeah, yeah. And we miss it. And they were in this shopping center, so there was a lot of traffic. Yeah, yeah. just people going past and just asking questions, and they were able to kind of correct the misinformation on this. And and importantly, they would show you how to charge. 
You yeah. don't even get that at the yeah. dealerships. Yes. <laughs> so so they they were they were lucky that they would have chargers literally outside, like a, a short thirty second walk away, and they would show you how to charge before they'd let you out with it. They'd also so, take you down to the charging hub as well, where like instead mm-hmm. of just the normal type two stuff, they would take you where you would normally go to a rapid charger, and there's like this is yeah, the how you pay rate. for it. This is how you plug it in. This is what it all means. Yeah. It was just so comprehensive of how they yeah. they instructed it. So if they can recapture that yeah. in, in this new offering they're going to do, then I think they're going to win. It's, it's, it, it would be fantastic if 100%. they could recapture that. 100%. Yeah. Who, who maybe, would have there's, maybe there's people that used to work there that are looking for another employment. Oh, yeah. I mean, loads of them actually... Employment. Loads of them work now for local garages. But the, who would have thought Dan, such a smart man. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, just, I'm obviously joking, but the, Dan is a very clever man and he comes up with that idea, these ideas and he knows... Where the niche is, or where the where the where there's a hole in the market, so to speak, right? And none of this is done for pure money reasons. This is all kind of done, you know, just to promote EVs. I love it. I, I'm, I, you know, I can't wait to see these these things happening. Has anybody attended yet any of the mega theater or giga theater sessions? No, I've been having too much fun outside. Snap. Thanks. I do know they did one yesterday. Sam Clark from GridServe was moderating it. They had Quentin Wilson. They had Lorna McAteer. They had Colin Walker talking about misinformation. Again, this is all linking into the stop burning stuff to the Electric Vehicles UK. A fair spec. charge, yeah. Fair charge, yeah. And it's it's one of those things that they do this now at every single one of the the events. And it's vital because... There are so many people who come in and we've all had these conversations. You know, I like this electric car because, oh, well, yeah, but, you know, there's the cobalt in there and it's been mined Mm. by the the kids in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's kind of, well, yes, that is happening, but that's also being used to desulfurize fuel. That's also being used for turbines in planes. That's also being used in your phone and in your laptop. It's not just cars. It's not just electric vehicles. (laughs) Oh, and by the way, if you're driving certain of the MG vehicles and certain Teslas, there's no cobalt in there at all. And this is the kind of thing that those sessions are highlighting to the people who are out there. And now you can also shut down the thing when people tell you, yes, you're charging your car from electric from a coal-fired power plant. Because there's no more they, coal stations. Exactly. <laughs> we do not in the UK, in yeah, the yeah, UK yeah. <laughs> anymore. So that argument is out the window. Yeah. I mean, this is one of those arguments where I, I always go as, a, as an engineer. <laughs> I'm, I'm always like, yes, but. <laughs> it, even if it's powered by, I think it, there have been studies done, even if your EV is powered by coal, it's still cleaner per mile than burning fossil fuels with yeah. all the like the chain of all the things and inefficiencies of the, yeah. uh, the you know, obviously depends on how you drive and all that. But let's be honest, the figures you get from manufacturers about the CO2 emissions on the petrol diesel cars are, I can't remember whether it's 10 times or just five times more that they emit in real life on average. Mm. But it, there's charities who do, do those things and I should probably have figures, but it, let's just say those figures are done in lab and there's been one OEM that's uh, had to cough up quite a lot of money for uh, diddling with those figures and I'm not saying that everybody else does it but you know I think it's also worth reminding people that we are still actually mining coal in the UK yep because there are certain things where you need coal for I think is it coking for steel steel production and I think we also export it so we haven't got rid of coal totally but there are now no more coal powered Fire stations in the UK. Yeah, they're not powering the national grid, basically, are they? There you go. I think coal power, well, coal power stations haven't been used much anyway, which is why they, they phased them out about 10 years ago. So they were there just in case. And then tech has moved some, so much forwards nowadays, and we have battery storage systems scattered around the country as well. Mm-hmm. They're not huge, but they're enough to kind of oomph the load if need be, or smooth out the load if need be. So I think that site was very expensive piece of kit sitting there and just basically it was an eyesore every time you drove past it anyway there are more solar farms coming online as well so just near me in Welling Garden City they've got approval for a, a massive solar farm as well which is just down the road from the new grids of uh, Stevenage electric forecourt so that's obviously those are happening up and down the country there's getting more sign off for these types of things so again the grid is becoming more greener anyway mm. cool I mean we have to give thumbs up to this event right 
Oh, absolutely. Always. I mean, it's Saturday, <laughs> but, you know. It's... It, it still is a good event. Yeah. It's, 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 it's Saturday. There's lots of people here. It's still dry. It's a good so social like as well, like out, so. meeting other yeah. people. Yeah. Like, like I mean, the, 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 the there, industry. Is, there is no... People, I think people are easily misled if they just read something online. Yeah. Or mate tells them that, oh, my mate, oh, meh, 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 which... By the way, if your mate tells you that their mate had a problem, <laughs> chances of, of that being real is about 1%, and chances of that being an, a problem that's widespread is even less. It's just, you know, what is the saying? The the lie goes around the world before the truth gets up of the, out of the bed or something? I like yes, that. he's boots yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, just, you know, be, be aware of that, because as humans, we're very flawed. But the, yeah, go on, Gary. Before we sort of wrap up, I think there's there's at least two other aspects to this show that we've completely glossed over. Oh. Um, and I think we should, it's not just electric vehicles. There's a lot of Indeed. home. Yeah. What's the word I'm looking for? Green solutions. Green solutions for homes. So there are a number of... Decarbonization of the, houses. That's the one, heating, oh, housing, et cetera. Okay. There are a number of companies here like Tepio who have the battery boiler, boiler I think. Mm. Yep. The yep. Boiler that, it's not a heat pump, it's not gas powered, it's a battery and it, it heats everything like a boiler. We've got Duracell who have home storage. So we've got now three phase available. Now three phase available. We've got Juju Solo, who've got the Juju, Joju, 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 Joju. Thank you. Who've got the, obviously solar offerings. Uh, My Energy here with their Zappies, with their all in one Give Energy are here. So there's a whole the whole aspect of home renewables and Bosch, the vegan food people. Yeah. And I know there's a couple of people around here who are going vegan. <laughs> but, you know, Greg and I appreciate that. I, ho- I hope to actually have them on to talk about veganism, veganism in the future. So if, you, if you're listening to this, Bosch people, that'd be a good one. Yeah. Um, I think for the first time, there's a tire manufacturer here as well. So we've got Hankook here who, as well, who are showing their like EV tires as well. Yes. So, so that's, that's, that's a new one. And, and they're actually quite a high-level sponsor of the event too. Mm-hmm. So, so that's always good. I'm, I'm looking around at winter tires at the moment because I'm, I'm getting a new car soon and I need to replace the tires because they're not going to fit. So I've, I've got a set. So I've been kind of speaking to them and seeing what they are and how much they are and, and, and speaking to good and everything. So speaking to affordability, that was one of the big things that Dan obviously mentioned during our media presentation on top of the, uh, the show when we, you know, yesterday, but it's true for the last two shows, I think the one in Harrogate and previous one in Fambra, there's been loads of announcements to get people to decarbonize their houses for less money or make it more affordable. So instead of you having taken a, a, take a loan, you basically can go straight to the, uh, the, the provider of certain services, where, where it's a heat pump or solar panels or battery storage, and actually get a zero or near 0% financing from them for, you know, I think in case of my, my energy, I th- that, did I hear it right? It was up to 25 years, which seems mad, but, you know, and they also give you actual coverage over that period of time. So they don't want the kit to actually go warranty. bad uh, yeah yeah so they extend the warranty over that period uh, which I think is brilliant it's the same thing or similar thing to like what Apple's doing with I can't remember what they call it no, it doesn't matter the, uh, you can get things for you know 20 quid a, a month mm. in case of in case of a phone and that covers you as well in case something goes wrong with it I, I'm sure it's more money than that to get a heat pump but you don't have to fork out you know a couple thousand pounds up front or get a loan for it you, or take it off your mortgage you just get that from the the actual provider, and yeah. then you know they're covering it for five whatever years. Mm-hmm. And I think they're also some of them are willing. I'm not going to speak obviously on their behalf, but some of them are willing to then take out that kit and move it to your house in case you move in the meantime. Obviously for a fee, but I think that's a good that's a good thing. Yeah. You, can, you can literally just walk to in this case my energy stand and say like I want a couple of these in my house. And no, I don't have to pay 10 grand up, up front for the battery storage. You can just spread the cost. I think that's brilliant. It makes more sense because, you know, even me looking at solar and battery storage for my house, it's still a huge upfront cost. And the more they do things like that, the more people are going to adopt to using it. Yeah. And, and we, we, we don't have to forget, we, we shouldn't forget about the fact that, no, you're not going to have 100% of energy coming from your solar, but you're mm. going to save a lot of money by having battery storage and something like Octopus Tariff referral link in the, in the link in the thing you doobly do as they call it <laughs> link in the show notes exactly you're gonna you're gonna potentially save a lot of money you might even make some money on a couple of months a year if you produce a lot of solar it depends on where your house is and all that obviously 
So I think it's a, it's a good thing. On a related topic, this is something that was announced uh, quite a while back and it seems to have fallen under the, the radar. Octopus Energy have what they call, I'll probably get the, the name wrong, a zero homes offering, a zero bills. Basically, if, if you're in a house that has been built to a specific standard so that the, the builder has, has adhered to certain standards for insulation, etc., you can get a tariff from Octopus where you will not pay any energy bills for five years. Nice. Which is phenomenal if, you've, if you can take advantage of that. So they will cover the electricity. Presumably it has to all be electrified rather than, than gas, but they'll, you know, I'm assuming there's got to be heat pump in there. Solar, solar panels, on the roof as well, yeah. Things like that. Okay. Especially um, if that's your first house, like all that sort of help right on the first five years is, is going to be amazing. Oh, absolutely. Remind me, what kind of business are they in? <laughs> <laughs> Giving away energy, apparently. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I would love to have Greg on from, the, from Octopus, but to talk about these things, or other people, because I'd be interested in, in hearing more about this. But mm. yeah, um, I think he's here today, isn't he? Isn't, isn't, isn't there a singing the gigas here to today? He's on a session today, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so he's in the building. A costume. <laughs> yeah. We should, we should bring him, I should send my PAs over. <laughs> Ga- Gary will smooth. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, I have no time today. I'm out looking at glove com- compartments. Oh dear. <laughs> glove, box. glove boxes. Glove boxes. New obsession. <laughs> I think we, we turned this 180 degrees or 360. I've, I've just had an idea. It's, it's, it's a glove box. How many pairs of gloves can you get in a glove box? Oh no. There you go. <laughs> Done. Forget Brilliant. potatoes and oranges. Oh, bananas. And bananas. Yeah. How many bananas. Corner stuff. How many gloves can you fit in a glove box? What size gloves? Charles yeah. gloves? Oh, no, no, no. Mittens? Don't need that detail. No. <laughs> the ladies' leather gloves, or are they driving Exactly. Gloves? No, you're yeah. just complicating we to, it. We there. need to know. Yeah. I think they have to be driving gloves, because, you know, cars and all that. <laughs> right, gentlemen, any final words? No, thanks for inviting us on to... My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for, yeah. you know, being around. Second yeah, time we've done this. It's, it's always fun. fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's good. Thank you like, very much. We, we enjoy doing this. We hope you enjoy listening to this. It is... I know it's quite random sometimes, but it, it is great fun to put this together. That's the fun of it. It's got to yeah. be random. This, is, this has been a fun episode of Take It Easy from Everything Electric Fumbra 2024.